Good afternoon. Um, this is really a celebration today, and this morning we've heard a lot about the work that has been done in the Urban Big Data Center over the last five years. And this afternoon we felt that it would be helpful to try and think a little bit more prospectively about the next five years. And what we're really interested in finding out your views and uh, where you think the whole area of big data is actually um, uh, taking place, uh, how that's going to develop. But to help us kick off this, we are very fortunate to have Tom, Tom Smith, with us. Um, and I think he, in a sense, encapsulates the uniqueness of both him, but also of what's actually happening more generally. Because he's worked, um, I understood this morning, in a university as well, but after that had a spin-out company which was involved with um, uh, helping the public sector and the third sector organisations to use information in a more co constructive, productive way. That was with the Oxford Consultants for Social Inclusion. He then moved to the Environment Agency uh, in that data advisory group, trying to look at the means by which uh, the impact of government data could be uh, maximised. And currently is working with the Office of National Statistics in the data science campus, um, where he is the managing director. And what he's trying to do here is to promote UK expertise in data services, trying to bring together the public and the private sector, looking at research and capacity building, but also, importantly, linking across government departments to get them to talk to each other, to get them to share data, and to get them uh, to use it more, uh, more productively. So it's with great pleasure that I hand over the floor to Tom. Thanks very much, David. Uh, follow that. I also wear very loud shirts, uh, and I talk quite fast. So I'll try and slow myself down, but if I'm talking too fast, wave at me. Also, if I'm telling, giving too much detail or actually you'd like me to move on, wave at me. I'm very flexible. Um, I'm also Data Smith on Twitter, so do follow me there. There's an underscore in there because there are lots of Smiths and I haven't yet found the other Data Smith, but when I do, I will probably have to kill them. Um, <laughs> so kind of just to pick up on some of David's points, I mean, I think for me, I've been working on data and particularly government data for a very long time. So I started stripping um, information out of housing benefit systems back in the early 90s uh, and in some places with the late 80s was sort of taking housing benefit records off, off, cover, off shelves and trying to digitise them. Um, I've then, but for a long time, I've been working with research teams in university trying to use that data to tell you something about the world, so deprivation levels or poverty levels and using administrative data for that kind of piece. Um, I then, my, my, my undergraduate was in physics and I got very interested in what you can do with the technologies that were coming through around particularly training neural networks. So I did my PhD in making robots play football, which uh, if anyone hasn't done it, I can really recommend. It's a great way to spend three years. Um, but, but what I really kind of got out of that was that there were a whole set of techniques and tools that were coming down the line that you could start applying to government data and government problems. And we didn't quite have the, 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 the processing power or the ability to work the size of data that we needed. And this was back in the mid-90s. So it's taken a bit of time, but we're now at a stage where I think the technology, where the infrastructure, where the tools, where the skills, and where the data is all starting to come together. And we've not, it's no surprise that we're seeing a huge hype cycle around things like AI and machine learning out in the commercial world. It's no surprise that we're seeing that in, in industry, but also in academia and government, in that this is a really good time to start applying your skill sets and having social impact, public good, and so on. And I really congratulate the Urban Centre, the Big Data Centre, for the work that you've done, and particularly sort of Nick and Mike and team around having developed this over the last five years, and I know Yvonne as well, um, and congratulations on the funding. So it's been an absolute pleasure working with you in the last two years, and look forward to much, much more. So that's the kind of background, and I, I guess I wanted to sort of talk a bit about, you know, what, what, why does government really care? And at heart, we're all about services. And if we can produce more effective, better services, or we can pay less and run them more cheaply so we don't have to take so much in tax, and that we can do things like improve public realm, tackle inequality, deprivation, reduce, improve living standards, all of those kinds of things are what government's about. But fundamentally, data and data science has a big part to play in that. 
And this is the kind of headline that we want to see. So this is a piece, this is an NHS group, essentially using prescription data and better prescribing practices based on a fairly straightforward analysis of what, what's being prescribed and why things like doing branded drugs versus generics, that saves you a huge amount. And some of you remember Open Data Institute publishing some work on that a few years back. Um, but just better use of analytics and data in, in those sorts of services. And there's a great opportunity. We want to see more of this, so kind of spread across. So what I'm going to do is give a few examples of this and how the sort of work that you're doing le le leads into that, sort of streams into that, and how we're, I think, doing a very similar piece of work but inside the system. So I'm going to give some examples of that. I'm also going to pick up what I think are some key points around collaboration, skill sets, different parts of different organisations, different sectors, to the way that government now needs to work more with academic sector and more with industry sector, and I'll kind of pick up on those as we go. And just before I do that, I'll step back, because some of you may not know who ONS are. Um, so I joined a couple of years ago to uh, help set up the Data Science Campus. But Office for National Stats, for those of you who are not intimately familiar with the different parts of government, we're the group that publishes data on GDP, on inflation rates, around the economy, so things that are used in decisions by businesses and so on. We also publish the census, so that's the standard underpinning infrastructure layer around who lives and where, those sorts of things. So that would be kind of very familiar to many of you, but perhaps not all. But we're also interested in data on the world. So we have the remit in, uh, for the UK of the Sustainable Development Goals. So those are indicators that UN is, is, leaving, is, is using to leave no one behind. So that 2030 programme, some of you will be involved in those. And we're also interested in trade, so we produce the trade statistics. Uh, and that's quite a, quite a high profile area at the moment. So you can imagine a lot of discussion and debate around these, these areas. We're a non-ministerial group, which means that we are essentially independent of the, politi the politics and government with large G. So we produce independent and impartial data and analysis and statistics that then feeds into decision making. So we produce data that helps make decisions, but we don't help those decisions, if you like. Um, and why the campus? I mean, a bit more background. A few year, over the last few years, there was a sense that some of the statistics work by ONS was kind of falling off the pace a bit. So the models of GDP and so on are quite standard, old you know, quite been going for some time. Survey data that ONS uses primarily for its outputs, and we have huge skills in. But again, we were starting to get kind of a, a, a bit of a beating, saying you're not keeping pace with the data that's being made available. Lots of people in the room work on that kind of data set, and you're not keeping pace with the sorts of skills that you need to use those data sources. And so as a result of that, the Data Science Campus was set up. We launched in March last year. Um, we're now 60 people. So that's a mix of data scientists, so folks like myself with PhDs up to 10 years in industry, in academia and so on, but also data science training faculty. Uh, we work with ONS and other parts of government. So similar to UDBC, we have an interest in skills building and delivering data science and helping and supporting working with, with, right across government. Um, so that's our kind of purpose and mission, if you like. Um, and we want to see and to help develop more of those headlines, that £581 million type thing. And I get a lot of kind of interest about this as a new subject. And people say, you know, and I'm filling rooms full of statisticians, and they say, you know, statistics, is, data science is just statistics. You know, there's nothing new about that. And then I would go next door and there's a room full of operational researchers, and they say, well, data science is just operations research, isn't it? You know, nothing new about that. And then big data... There's nothing new about that either. We've always been trying to use sources of data to understand problems and produce and help solutions. So this is big data circa 1939. It is London underground workers sorting, I think, four million tube tickets in order to improve, optimise train routes, numbers of trains, and optimise user experience, if you want to use the commercial term. So if anyone comes back to you and says, our data's crap, it's really hard to work with. You know. <laughs> I always think I should put that picture up on the wall. Um, but roll it forward, you know, roll forward sort of 75 years or so, and Transport for London is still trying to do exactly the same thing. They've now got Oyster card or credit card check-in, check-out, so you've got point-to-point -point journeys. 
You can do things like Wi-Fi data collection from boxes, which many of you will be familiar with, sort of footfall. Lots of commercial retailers do this. Um, there was a pilot that TfL ran in tube stations, which gave you the actual routes that people took through the system. So I think this is routes from St Pancras to Waterloo. There are a lot of different options. And that's data for optimising services. So it's all about operations. And so the point is, we're not often not trying to do new stuff. We've just got new tools to work with. So the final one really about the kind of the government interest, and this is, is a, to make the point, really kind of emphasise, this is not just technical. It's not just groups who are working on data that really care about this stuff. And if I had to say the, what's the one big thing that's shifted in the last few years, I think it's the recognition from senior, le senior leaders, managers, people who don't really care about data at all or analysis or anything like that. They just care about better services or better outputs for their organisation. But the re recognition that data and data science is a fundamental part of what they're doing. So this is John Manzoni, he's the chief exec of the entire civil service, uh, ultimately bo my boss. We all have a, something written into our contracts, so we have to quote him on every speech. <laughs> um, but this is, so getting data right is the next phase of public service reform. And we, every government department is, is essentially working as hard as possible on doing that. So there's the background. So I want to kind of pick up some of the examples, maybe, and kind of start from a... Um, you know, just kind of start unpicking some of this a little bit. And so kind of where do we go in terms of making more headlines like that? And lots of the examples today, and it's fascinating streams, and I'm sorry I couldn't have cloned myself four times to go to each of the streams. But a lot of the examples today started with things like satellite imagery, Strava, some really exciting data sources. And I think you need to kind of step back one. So this is uh, the Phaistos disk. It was discovered around the turn of the century, 1900s, in, in Crete. It's the oldest known language, European language, that we've been able to, trans, to, we've been able to decipher. It's Linear B. And all the stuff that we found in Linear B, which was finally deciphered in the 50s, it's a good story if you're interested in that kind of thing, all of it is, is records of what was being held in the palace storerooms, what was being held and what was stored. It's administrative data. So the oldest language, we've, European language, we've been able to de decipher is admin data. <laughs> yeah? Now that looks pretty hard to decipher. I'll give you this. This is admin, linked administrative data circa 2018. This is what ONS is trying to do internally inside the house. For every part of administrative data that government holds, we are interested in linking. Now, the two things here. The first is, there's a legal gateway. So the Digital Economy Act enables government agencies, to parts of government, to share data for the purposes of research and statistics only. So ONS can bring together lots of that data and link it in order to then help drive statistics and help drive research. So that's a huge step forward, I think, and that came through only this year. That's given us a kind of step change. The second thing is that a lot of this is quite technical work that lots of people are duplicating. I'm sure there are lots of people in the room who try to spend lots of their time doing fuzzy matching across addresses or between businesses where you've got kind of bits of the puzzle. We're trying to link in longitudinal business data. So we have salaries like PAYE. We have VAT data from HMRC. We're trying to link in things like educational information because DFE is interested in this. And some of you will have seen headlines recently about the value of a degree. Many of you in academia will care passionately about that kind of thing, and rightly. The value of a degree in terms of pure monetary value, you can look at. You track people through. What jobs did they get? What's, how does that compare to against samples that didn't go for that degree? <coughs> does the different type of degree matter? That kind of thing. All of that's possible through linked administrative data. And it enables a whole set of questions to be tested that is very, very difficult to do with big data, and it's very, very difficult to do with surveys unless they're huge and very expensive. But you can do it. So I think this is a step change. And so, kind of just to give one example of how we're using this in ONS now. We have HMRC providing us with VAT data. This is business tax data. 
for individual companies, highly sensitive. So all of the work we do around data security and maintenance and management and so on, kind of a big part of ONS's job. Um, we have linked that into our work on calculating GDP and use the VAT data here. Now you've got essentially real-time companies decide what, you know, filing in their, their VAT returns. That comes in in real time to HMRC. It's provided, once the system is properly up and running, provided really very quickly across to us. As a result of this kind of ongoing process of work around VAT, we can now publish GDP measures every month. And that started, um, I think, some, uh, uh, quite recently. That compares to the quarterly before. And you kind of think, well, GDP, you know, make a few headlines, whatever. Um, what's monthly got to do with quarterly? You know, what, what, what's, the, what's the advantage? This is where things like faster data actually make a difference because you have levers that you can apply or pull if you know something's happening. And the Bank of England estimate on the downturn of 2008, which is up here, was that faster data or faster knowledge that the recession, the downturn was hitting, would have had an impact of £12 billion on the economy by now. And that's a huge sum, it's an eye-watering sum, just for data, yeah? So because the bank can then pull levers around interest rates, access to credit, and so on and so forth. So you've got that link through from what you're doing, with data sources, linking it. In this case, it's fairly straightforward analysis. It doesn't even need deep learning, neural networks, whatever. It's straightforward. But using administrative data, you've been able to produce something which would have had a huge impact. Now, if there are another downturns coming, we should hopefully have a faster recognition of that. So that kind of point about linked administrative data is high value and high impact. And that's just one example. There are lots like that. Um, <coughs> so I'll go on a bit. Probably go on a lot. But uh, I will go on and talk a little bit about some of the other data sources. Um, you might be... Oh, this is being recorded, isn't it? Government doesn't have all the answers. There we go. <laughs> we all know this. Um, but it's really here about the data. The data, and I think we're probably in a position now where government no longer holds or knows more about the world than other organisations. So the many industries form data or produce data as byproducts. And also a great number of industries now use data as their actual product. So things like social media, the data, the information, the text is the service, if you like, to the public. Um, so we need to recognise that the data outside the system is of, of huge value if we're trying to understand, in ONS's perspective, the economy or society, um, for other government departments, perhaps policy trends or things that they need to take into account when making policy. So the public sector absolutely does not have all of the answers does not have all of the data. So let's give an example around some of the work we've been doing in the campus. <clears throat> so the Natural Capital Accounts team is looking at the value of the environment for purposes of trying to put this into balance sheets. And uh, this has a number of kind of factors. First is if you can value, you know, so if you can measure something, then you can obviously value it. Um, but in other cases, if you can produce indicators of, say, of particular aspects of the environment, so you can then build them into things like health outcomes models. So we think the environment has an impact locally. So there are, there are the estimates of the value of particular parts of the economy, of, of the environment. And in this case, trees and so on across urban areas. Um, impact through removing air pollution. Lots of stuff like that. Now we can sit and talk about the kind of models that are being used there. And say, well, is it 1.4 million tonnes? You know, That's complicated stuff. There will be estimates there, of course. But the general point here is that this, this issue has a, a good, positive and high impact on public health. What we don't have, though, is data on trees, vegetation, so on, at local level. And there aren't many data sources we could use here. So serve statisticians like surveys. You could run a huge crowdsourcing survey. There are other things you could do. But one of the things we looked at at the campus was using Google Street View. Now, this is a very widely available data sources, images. It's a high granularity, so it's available very locally. It's available around every single street in the country, pretty much, and indeed worldwide, with patchy coverage. 
So we set out with the question, the tech question for our team is can we produce a geospatial da data set and estimates of local vegetation levels, trees, shrubs, hedges and so on, based on street view. Now this kind of takes us into places that stat statisticians aren't normally that familiar with. Um, obviously you'll need to think, start thinking about how you segment, classify images, you need to think about those tools, you might need to think about training data or validation data and so on. Um, so a whole, whole bunch of things. And I won't go into technical details, but I'm happy to sort of point you at the work. Um, <coughs> but the, the kind of bottom line here, and again, we won't go into much of this detail, the bottom line here is we're using a particular flavour of convolutional neural network, it's a pyramid scene passing network, um, it's based around the concepts of how the eye works, and we're, we've been validating it against a open data set from Mapillary um, and producing very high, ac very highly accurate estimates or segmentations of what you're seeing, and then sampling street view at 10 metre intervals around the country in urban areas and using that to produce the data set. Um, the kind of bo bottom line is starting from open street map, running through large number of street view images, percentage coverage within those images, and then get to an urban vegetation map. And last week we produced, published out our first estimates of this for two cities uh, close to our hearts, so Newport and Cardiff, which is the closest to, to the team HQ, um, but we're working on chunking that up to get to national coverage. Um, that gives you a new data set, which is based on a completely novel source for anyone in Office for National Statistics, or particularly government, and it gives you an output that you can then use both for natural capital ana analysis and also in further follow-on models of health outcomes and other types of outcomes where you want to test, is there an environmental factor? Might this be an indicator at local level that I can build into those models? There are other indicators available, but this is, I think, a very interesting one. And one final thing in terms of kind of putting that to impact, because the data sources we were using are, have coverage globally, Again, some countries will have patchy coverage compared to the UK. We've put this all up onto a, a piece of work that we're working with the UN, called the UN Global Platform, and essentially open sourced it so that every stats agency in the world can run the same analysis and produce the same, same work. So the UN Global Pulse and folks in Indonesia and other countries are now starting to use this. Which is probably a good point to say that all of our work is published openly so that's methods. All of our projects are on GitHub. So there are some that are not public, which are not on GitHub. You, you won't see the private repos. But all of the code is there. It's totally reusable. All of our outputs are published under open government license. So again, reusable. All the methods and so on and all the results. Um, so that's one of the things that we're kind of working with community to reuse. Okay. I'll come back to this. GDP measure and kind of talk about something, kind of just track that on a little bit. So this was using VAT, so government data. You can also use other parts, other data from other sources. And essentially, if you're interested in rapid indicators of the economy, which can help you make decisions on changing interest rates, that kind of thing, then basically the world's the oyster. Because there's a, pretty much any data source you can think of that has high frequency, low lag, can give you something of, in, of interest. And now some of those are just going to be proxies, and you might use them in a model, you might not. Some of them are going to be direct measures. And so here are a few, and we've been working on each of these. So the first is that road traffic is interesting. So I think this, the Netherlands um, colleague will, I don't remember, I recognize this from CBDS. Um, if you look at volume of traffic on the roads, then you will see that that predicts or correlates very closely with GDP in total. So you have a possible measure there. Now it's noisy as hell because lots of road traffic is not GDP based, it's not, you know, it's not economically based. But that is an interesting predictor, an interesting indicator to use. If you're interested in trading goods, every ship in the world above a certain weight pings up its GPS coordinates, and that's the automated identification system. Um, we've access to that and we're looking at what's the trade in goods, or what is the shipping coming into UK ports looking like in a real-time basis. That gives us some statistics, like tonnage by port, which is sort of a very easy one to produce, but it also gives you a potential for 
re rapid and fast recognition of changes in trade. It also tells you something about the main trade routes in real time. What you really want is what's on those ships, and I'll come back to that in a minute. The final one on this slide, internet use. So 80% of the UK economy is service-based, doesn't involve goods. Lots of that goes by the web or goes by the tube. Uh, so if you have measures or indicators or data sources that tell you about something to do with broadband or internet use, then that potentially gives you something about the local economy. So we're looking here at the main spines that are serve each of the urban areas across the UK and looking at patterns. And this is a very old one, I think this is from one of the World Cups in 2006. Kind of when I used to you could look at your energy use, one of the big things was the highest point of energy use was half time when everyone went, went in the football, when everyone went and put on their kettles. You kind of see a little peak in 2006 when everyone went and got on their phones or whatever it was in half time. This year it's flipped around. So we were looking at the data the day after the England games, and you see at half time there's a drop because loads of people are watching the game on their smartphones. So you do have a very complicated pattern here. But you can pick up, for example, commuter use, timings, by urban areas and differences. And so that's one there really to, that we're digging into with the economic team and Bank of England looking at. So I'm very interested to see the, the work here that's related to this. So the bottom line is that there are lots of leading indicators of the economy. There's a really obvious one which is spend. And so this kind of brings us perhaps onto the collaboration aspect. I talked about not having all the data. That's certainly true, but we also don't have all the skills. That's also true. And one of the things we wanted to build at the campus was collaborations with external data holders that we could work with, very similar to the UDBC model. And one of those projects that we started off, which has taken some time to build up, was working with Barclays and getting a joint project going using their data and some of the economic expertise in ONS. Um, we now have two of the team um, seconded into Barclays and using two or well, one data source primarily which is the merchant spend system so this is what's being spent in what merchants linked to sector over time and we're interested then in sp expanding that up to the credit to work on credit card data again all of this is at aggregate level we're not interested in individual spend just on what or over the overall patterns but you potentially here got a very fast readout onto which sectors of the economy are doing well, badly, which areas, what do the patterns look like. It might be interesting questions like what, what sectors are active in, in the night time or in particular areas that local authorities and other groups may want to support. You've also got the rapid readout onto household spend, credit card spend, and through this system, and these systems are quite a big component of that. So again, really interesting to see what you can do with this. this so comments now be going three months, and we're starting to see the first results coming out. Um, so we'll be able to aim to publish something soon. The final one on this, now I'm going to leave this a bit of a question. We have very clear models, so national accounts, the clear models of how, of what, how we measure the economy, what we're trying to pick up. One of the things that we look at is, is inflation in various ways, and that feeds into all sorts of things. So, obviously, pay rises, mortgage increases, that kind of stuff. But there's this question about what does inflation really mean? And when you start getting access to the sort of data sources that you folks are looking at and that we're interested in, you start kind of digging down something that's quite, really quite interesting. So this is, I don't know if you can read the details from there, but this is... Um, prices for a standard commodity, so in this case a monopoly board, over it was about a three, four year period, I think. And it varies from a five quid up to about £19.50. It's a standard commodity. This is on Amazon and uh, another system. It's just web scraped in this case. But what you've got here is what does inflation really mean? If you're talking about how much people pay for stuff, and how much that's changing over time, what you need to do is look at the standard consistent product here and here, and then say what was the change between them. And kind of classical economics says, well, the change sort of happens a bit like that, and price fluctuations are a, a product of demand and all that kind of thing. When you've got price fluctuations on this scale, and also where your data sources 
are being are accessible by consumers who are using those data sources to make decisions. So you might well have a bot, an alert that tells you when it goes below a certain amount at which point you'll buy. Then the idea of this, there's an inflation rate that we can produce and publish becomes a much more kind of slippery, nebulous thing. So I wanted to leave that with you, because I think those are some of the big questions that we're grappling with, certainly at ONS, folks like the Bank of England. Every single area has those questions. But when you've got the more data you have access to, the more I think you start to question the sort of underlying concepts that you're thinking about, or test them in very interesting ways. Um. <coughs> so, a couple of extra points, areas. A couple of people mentioned earlier, and certainly Nick in his intro, about the importance of the tech side and of being able to use work with data at scale, and also then making that re-available for use. It's obviously one of the great things that, that you're doing here. <coughs> that certainly plays across to us, so lots of us are trying to do the same sorts of things. And so just to give you a sense of, of where ONS is at the moment, we've spent probably about four years or so changing our technical infrastructure and moving to a point where all analysts across ONS access the data and analyze the data on a single platform. Um, it's essentially cloud, but it's in ground commercial, so it's cloud on the ground, if that makes sense. Um, I won't talk about that, but that's just a huge part of what we can do at the campus. So people say, oh, that's great stuff doing, you know, they've done this with that data. Without this 95% and all the hard yards that have gone into that, then we can't really do that. So don't underestimate, certainly in the academic sector, the value of having infrastructure in terms of data storage, maintenance, management, data acquisition, and so on, for reuse. That's the first thing. The second thing is that many of you are obviously very familiar with the admin research centres. Um, the secure research service at ONS is our service that we are starting continuing to power up. It used to be called the Virtual Microdata Lab. Um, it now, our aim is that all of the data that I talked about that we're collecting in will be available in a secure, robust way for process of buffer analysis, for projects that are public good. So our eventual aim is that all of the underlying government data sets, except those that are kind of you know, totally below the surface, are able for reuse there. There's lots of security aspects to that, but that's something that really we support the, the, the uh, uh, academic groups uh, working on public sector, pu public good missions and projects. So that's really worth finding out about if you're not aware of that. And I think the kind of value coming up is how we interface and link to some of the other teams out there doing similar work. I want to say something about communities as well. Um, Although the campus is a new group, there's a huge community of data scientists in government. Many of you will kind of be familiar with some of those in different organisations. One of the things that, I, that surprised me in a really good way was the level of collaboration that goes on across government in these communities. People outside of government often think of us as silos. The kind of narrative obviously often emphasises that, the sort of you know, conflict between departments narrative. The community within government are highly collaborative, and that's been a big part of, sort of data science success, I think. So it's visible and it's active, and there's certainly a lot of support there. So most department eight groups are now trying to publish their work out through GitHub, that kind of stuff, you know, wherever possible, and sharing all of their tools and so on. Um, so it's well worth kind of looking into that group. There are also similar communities in analysis functions. Um, looking at statisticians and engineers and so on. So again, there is this kind of strong, don't reinvent, you know, work with the community on stuff that's already been, been done elsewhere, perhaps. Um, I've talked a lot about projects. I just want to say something about the kind of skills building. So this is a big part of the campus work. So we have a data science faculty. We run courses. We, we, we've commissioned a master's delivered by a number of universities. And we've just launched an economic data science PhD program with the Turing Institute. And we're looking at sort of ramping up and supporting that. And we have a lot of PhDs that we work with from individual universities to cut, second in and often access the government data inside. So through secondments directly into the system. So there's lots of things there that we work on. 
And I'll just finish with a couple of more, exam exa there's a couple of more examples of, of that community work and what we do across the piece. Um, but just to emphasise that collaboration aspect, we work with lots of different part academic sectors, groups, but also commercials as well. But I just want to finish with a couple of the community examples that come out from across government. We think some of these might be quite interesting in terms of the impact of data science. Um, and the first is that every single bit of government publishes out statistics and reports, and they tend to do this by hand, and some poor, poor bugger as a junior is sitting there turning the handle. We've probably all had that, that job. Um, putting that into a system where actually you can go from input data right through to external finished published reports is an absolute critical time saver, job saver, boredom saver, etc. Um, so we have now developed across the government data science community, so led by GDS primarily, and something called reproducible analytical pipelines. It's a standard way of approaching this. Those of you who are used to coding and open source and so on, it will be sort of a no-brainer, but essentially it's applying software engineering standard tools and techniques through to report generation, which is quite an interesting application. So if you want to automate some of your report outputs, it's quite a nice approach. Um, so that's a big one. I, I should probably just point at the top number. So you sometimes think of the kind of cool stuff being hard and taking a long time and having impact. But that as a sort of saving in terms of analyst time and researcher time is a huge chunk. You know, so it's really worth thinking of the savings that you can have across government side. The second example that I want to give about the community is this comes out of work that we've been doing mentoring other folks in government. So, and I, I'm not sure, I'd be interested to see how this reads across to, the, to, to, to your areas. But we run, so ONS and GDS and Government Office for Science run something called the Government Data Science Accelerator, where any analyst in government can essentially bid in for three months support. So you get a new laptop if you need it, you get a mentor in the ONS, we have everyone come in one day a week. So they're physically on site, the rest of the time they're in their own offices. They have to have support from the line managers because they're going to lose some of the on their team. But it has to be a problem that will help their team, otherwise their line manager is never going to sign it off. So you have a three-month project, and this is one of those projects. So one of my data science group mentored this project. So for someone from the UK Hydrographic Office, who are basically tasked with charting the, world, the, the ocean, producing maps, producing understanding the marine environment, that kind of side. Probably people in the room will know better than I do. One of the questions they had is how can we keep updated data on stuff that isn't yet on our charts or that we don't yet know about? So maybe wind turbine arrays that are going up quite quickly or oil, or, um, you know, oil platforms that have been towed into place. So marine environment hazards, that kind of stuff. So essentially we, did a, we, took, we looked at satellite data and we did a fairly straightforward piece with them. And to be blunt, they didn't need much support. It was more a bit of you know, you could look at this, this, and this, and they did, and they'd done it. Um, and we, they produced out of this essentially a trained model based on UK data, which they then applied worldwide, which produced, I think, a couple of hundred new envir marine environment obstacles or things that they did not know about before, including quite a lot in the Gulf. Um, so things like, as I said, wind turbines, platforms, large shipping, you can click those sorts of things out. That's now gone into production, so it's provided as an output by UKHO, so it improves what we know and what shipping has available to it, what sh information shipping has available. So again, kind of high impact from a reasonably small project that came out of this mentoring program. Um, and there's the uh, data scientist presenting at one of the government events to basically talk about this. I've got loads more examples, so I'm going to kind of think I'm on time now. Something like 40 minutes. So I've, I'm going to kind of flick through on these, but just to flag up, lots of people interested in social media signals. You won't be surprised there. Google flu trends and all the associated issues with that, notwithstanding, it's potentially an interesting source. At the campus, we're very, very interested in text data. So one of our projects is looking at what's on lorries and what's on ships. We have, in some cases, access to raw manifest data. In some cases, that's even truckies, lorry drivers, taking pictures of their manifests on their mobile phone, and we've got those sources. 
but we've produced out of a, a, a tool here to standardly categorize all of that data into the standard trade of goods categories. You can apply that in any, any particular situation. There are lots of areas that we're looking at there. Public consultations, similarly, we're interested in what you can do to automatically assess um, the, the topics that are coming up in consultations. You can kind of imagine what those sorts of things might be at the moment. Um, very interesting text data. We're very interested in other sources of information that perhaps haven't yet been categorised or yet um, used at scale, so patent data. We've working with the IPO, the Intellectual Property Office, but also Cabinet Office, on using the raw text for patents on what are the emerging technology trends, how do they relate to the industrial strategy grand challenges, so that's things like clean energy, and where are the UK strengths and weaknesses. So you can use this sort of source to give yourself or produce a very interesting insight into an area that's very complex. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I think maybe just kind of wrap up some of the key points that I thought I used. And the first part is linked admin data. Every stats agency in the world has been working on this. Some haven't run censuses since the 70s, like um, Denmark, Netherlands, and so on. That's our absolute first prize. If we can make that available across the piece to academics working on social good pro 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 projects, then I think there's a huge, huge value there. Um, public sector doesn't have all the data. That's a kind of a call for more collaboration both the groups like yourselves, but also industry-owning, data-owning bodies. Um, don't reinvent wheels. I think that infrastructure point is so important. I've lost count of the number of times people have approached me and said, I've got a research project that needs data from DWP. Can you help? You know, and those of you who've tried to get data from government agencies know that's a tough, tough deal. Uh, and the final one, those of you who are data scientists in the room, use your skills for good. You can work in any industry, and it's one of the hot topic areas, and it will be for some time. So uh, work on pub public projects. There's a lot of good stuff out there. So uh, look forward to working with you all.